welcome everyone to worship. Good to see everybody today. Um, now the bulletin says this is the sixth Sunday after Pentecost. And, and that's liturgically correct. But it's also British Open Sunday golf tournament. And um, knowing, you know, my, my uh, interest in, in the game of golf, you must uh, also know that the sermon's going to be real short today. <laughs> I'm sure you understand. Uh, I don't have an earbud in here. I want you to know that. I'm, I'm, you've got my undivided attention. But um, I'll, um, I'll be making tracks right after the benediction today to see what's going on with the British Open. So. I just want you to know that ahead of time today. We're glad you're here. Um, do sign the friendship pads. Uh, there's literature back in the narthex, the usual uh, pieces for you to pick up. And um, we are at the point of saying, now let us worship God. Please stand for the call to worship. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Christ himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Let us worship the living God. Let us pray. 
Eternal God, author of our life and end of our pilgrimage, guide us by your word and spirit amid all things stations, that we may not wander from your way nor stumble in the darkness, but may finish our course in safety and come to our eternal rest in you. Through the grace and merit of Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now let us go before the Lord, confessing our sin and asking his forgiveness. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you. Amen.
Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, looking to Jesus, the perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross and disregarded its shame. She said, we still can't give a children's sermon. <laughs> so what do we have to do to make God love us more? Nothing. That's what I'm going to tell them. Nothing. Okay. <laughs> going to talk to the kids about, you know, what do you do with your friends to try to make them like you? And the bottom line is, what we all know, nothing we can do to make God love us more. Nothing we can do to make God love us less. In the spirit of being concise, that's the bottom line of the message. Amen. 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 Very good. Yes. That was a whole lot <laughs> Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and love, that we may be obedient to your will and live always for your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Our first lesson is from Psalm 52. Hear the word of the Lord. Why do you boast, O mighty one, of mischief done against the godly? All day long you are plotting destruction. Your tongue is like a sharp razor, you worker of treachery. You love evil more than good and lying more than speaking the truth. You love all words that devour, O oh, deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous will see and fear and will laugh at the evildoer, saying, See the one who would not take refuge in God, but trusted in the abundant riches and sought refuge in wealth. But I am not like a but I am like a green olive tree in the house of the Lord. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because of what you have done. In the presence of the faithful, I will proclaim your name, for it is good. The word of the Lord.
Thank you, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Judy and choir, Pabby. Mike, that's one of the best children's sermons I have ever heard. And in the spirit of being concise, I like that. He just a nice segue there. And I was thinking, you know, British Open Sunday does have its advantages. Uh, you get to beat all of your friends and neighbors to lunch at Frank's. You get there earlier than anyone else, right? Or, or Mansour's. So I'll get you out of here a little soon today, <clears throat> and you can, uh, you can enjoy that benefit. Second lesson is from the 10th chapter of Luke, verses 38 through 42. Let us hear now the good news. Now as they went on their way, he, Jesus, entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. <clears throat> but the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better, better part, which will not be taken away from her. The word of the Lord. <clears throat> and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Well, back in college, after my second year, I moved off campus into um, a three-bedroom apartment and one of my roommates was a guy named Stanley Kaiser. The other roommate was coming a couple of weeks later. So Stanley Kaiser and I lived in this apartment, just the two of us, uh, for the first couple of weeks, and, and it was great. I, you remember your own college days, and you know it was so great to have to move out of the dorm, get out of that confined atmosphere and all the rules and regulations and have your own place. It was, in fact, for myself, the first time that I had ever lived on my own without parental supervision. That is, without having my mother clean up after me. Now, I don't need to go into detail here, but after seven days of hamburger and tuna helper, you should have seen our kitchen sink was a few Petri dishes short of a biology lab. <clears throat> That's when the next guy moved in, a guy named William Hubbard. Now, from the standpoint of bacterial infection, I'm very glad that William finally arrived because William was our complete opposite. Think Felix Unger to our Oscar Madison from The Odd Couple. He was a meticulous housekeeper. You might say he came by it honest. His father was a dry cleaner. <clears throat> now, I don't think he would mind me telling you this, but it was William Hubbard who taught me how to wash dishes. A formative experience for me. To this day, when I do the dishes, I employ the Hubbard method of dish washing. Painstaking, thorough. I've even been known to rewash a dish that Colleen had already washed, simply because it never would have passed the Hubbard test. Well, since then, William Hubbard's gone a long way. He went to law school. He ended up becoming chairman of the board of trustees of, of my alma mater. And right now he is the Dean of South Carolina's Law School. Done quite well. Quite a guy. Quite a guy. Still, with respect to today's story, 
not a man after Jesus' heart. Instead, it would appear that Jesus is more inclined toward the Stan Kaisers and Don Framptons of the world, who were a little messy and left things for later. Those for whom tidiness could wait, whose office desks are piled high with little signs that read, a clean desk is the sign of an idle mind. Those who put off today what they can always do tomorrow. Now then, in one of the most delightful stories of the New Testament, in which no one is plagued with demons, no one conspires to make Jesus look foolish, and no puzzling paradoxical statement of Jesus is uttered. In this story that we have today, our Lord gem gently reprimands a woman for doing the dishes. That's what's going on here. Now, its appeal, of course, lies in its relevancy to actual human life. Sometimes it's kind of hard to take scripture and apply it to real life. It's tough. Uh, sometimes it's almost impossible to do. But this one's easy. Then, 2,000 years ago, people would busy themselves with routine tasks. Now, people still busy themselves with routine tasks. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing the chores. Sometimes they take our mind off of our worries. Lots of times they do. You've heard of work therapy. Sometimes they must be done before we can think clearly. That is my wife to a T. And I know she's not here to defend herself, but she would agree. She has to get things cleaned up and put away before she can think clearly, she says. And I understand that. No one wants her sink to look like a biology lab. The point of today's story is not the relative merits of routine tasks that must be done. The point of today's story is knowing when to set them aside. Today is a lesson in discipleship. It's a lesson in what it means to follow Jesus. So today Jesus visits with a woman who is devout, who has trouble hearing the word of God because she's too busy doing stuff. So Jesus offers her an example of how to be, and it is her sister who is sitting at the feet of Jesus. It's almost like Jesus is saying, there is a time to do the dishes, to do busy work, to do stuff that needs to be done, but there's also a time to sit and to listen. As disciples of Jesus Christ, sometimes you and I just need to sit and to listen to the Word of God. To sit at the feet of Jesus and to listen to Him and to learn from Him. Martha, Martha, Jesus says to her as she scurries about the kitchen complaining about her lazy sister Mary. Martha, Jesus says, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing and that is my word in your life. That's exactly what we need today for the living of these days, as our opening hymn so wonderfully puts it. The word of God in our lives is what we most need for the living of these days. <clears throat> Challenges abound. 
We live in a sinful and a broken world. And we see things that are not working and we want to do something to fix it. I know I do. But sometimes the best thing to do is to stop and to listen and to ponder and to pray and to reflect and to open ourselves to the living Lord Jesus and what he would say to us. And then go from there. Sometimes we need to do nothing more, nothing less than listen to the word of God. We are reminded that God's word commands us to be loving, to be neighborly, and to be just. Pretty simple. We listen to this, and then we move on. In such a way, we reorient ourselves <clears throat> as Christians. It's a way to start the day. We reorient, reorient ourselves toward a life of discipleship, to follow Jesus into the world, doing the gospel message, justice and love. We reorient ourselves to his word. Remember Jesus said, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Sometimes the word of the Lord is kind of harsh for us to hear. It's difficult for us to sit there and listen to. Sometimes God, God's word corrects us. Sometimes it implicates us. Sometimes it accuses us. And you know, we hear it and we'd rather go into the next room and do the dishes <laughs> and not sit there and listen to what God would have to say to us. We'd rather be out of air, earshot, busying ourselves with routine tasks than sitting and listening and learning. Many times, I know figuratively, I get up and I leave to do some work or some task rather than ponder what God might be saying to me in that moment. It's a wonderful distraction when I do. But I miss listening to God. In his little book, Tuesdays with Maury, which came out a long time ago, and some of you probably read it. Writer Mitch Albom movingly chronicles the final months of Maury Schwartz's life. Maury Schwartz was his teacher for many years in the university, and he was now dying of Lou Gehrig's disease, Maury Schwartz. Maury was Mitch's favorite college professor, and his book, Tuesdays with Maury is a compilation of aphorisms and sage insight from a terminally ill man. These lessons on life and love take place weekly on Tuesdays. The following is from the lesson on having regrets in life. Mitch Albom writes, The first time I saw Maury, I wondered what regrets he had once he knew that his death was imminent. Did he lament losing friends? Would he have done much differently? Selfishly, I wondered if I were in his shoes, would I be consumed with sad thoughts of all that I had missed? And when I mentioned this to Maury, he nodded. He said, it's what everyone worries about, isn't it? What if today is my last day on earth? Maury studied my faith, my face, writes Mitch, and perhaps he saw an ambivalence there. Mitch, Maury said, I shook my head and said nothing, but Maury picked up my hesitation. Mitch, he said, the culture does not encourage you to think about such things until you're about ready to die. We're so wrapped up in busy work, in things that 
have less meaning in the long run. We're involved in trillions of little acts just to take our minds off of ourselves. So we don't get into the habit of standing back and taking a look at our lives and saying, is this all I want? Is something missing? Mitch, he said, we all need someone to probe us in that direction because it will not happen automatically. Mitch Alvum said, I heard those words and I knew that that someone probing me was sitting right across from me. We all need teachers in our lives and mine was sitting opposite me. See, I think that's kind of what this text is about today. It's something along that line. We all need teachers in our lives and ours is also sitting in front of us, the rabbi speaking to us through scripture. And the lesson of today's story is that whenever the presence of God is in the room, whenever through some turn of event or in your prayer life or even in conversation with another, you believe that God may be speaking a unique word to you. Whenever this happens, then stop what you're doing and listen and pay attention. In so doing, you and I will choose the portion that Mary has chosen in today's story. The portion that Mary has chosen, the main course, if you will, is Jesus, the Word made flesh. This, Jesus says, is the better part, and it will not be taken away from you nor will it be taken from us. Our Lord today teaches us at times that it is better to pause, to ponder, to listen, to be open to the Word of God in that moment and then to move on with our tasks. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us stand and say what we believe using the affirmation of faith, which is the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, <clears throat> suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we look to God in prayer, our pastoral prayer, followed by the praying together of the Lord's Prayer. Gracious God, you taught us to pray not only for ourselves, but for people everywhere. So hear us as we pray for others in the name of Jesus Christ. Inspire the whole church with your power, unity, and peace. Grant that all who trust you may obey your word and live together in love. Lord, in these fractious times, 
We ask that you lead all nations and peoples in the way of justice and goodwill. Direct those who govern that they may rule fairly, maintain order, uphold those in need, and defend the oppressed. Indeed, dear God, we ask that you awaken all people to the dangers that we have inflicted upon the earth and plant in each a reverence for all that you have made that we may preserve the delicate palates of creation for all coming generations. Comfort and relieve, dear God, all who are in trouble, all who sorrow, those who are poor, people that we know and those who are not known to us who are sick, those who grieve. Heal them, dear God, in body, mind, or circumstance, working in them by your grace wonders beyond all they may dream or hope. And bring to our remembrance all those who, having served you on earth, now sing your praises eternally. May their endurance give us courage and their faithfulness give us hope. Through Christ our Lord, who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, let us remember the words of Christ, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let us give our morning offering. Lord, you teach us to think of others before we think about ourselves. 
You teach us to be giving and generous people. You teach us that the good life is the giving life. And so receive this offering in that spirit. We willingly bring to you this that we set before you now, these gifts, and ask you to use them to your glory and us to your service. In the name of Christ, amen. This week, God's Word teaches us to be attentive to that Word in our lives, and in some cases to stop what we are doing and sit and listen to what the Lord may be saying to us, teaching us, and we will be the better for it, and then we can go out and serve the Lord with gladness. And when we do, let us remember the words of the Apostle Paul. Whatever is true and honorable and just, whatever is pleasing and pure and commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. And the grace of Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and all days. Amen. Amen.